Hi everyone, my name is FlagonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore Nuzlocke of Pokemon Ultra Sun. To see what I define as hardcore Nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace, and we're playing on set mode. In most of my hardcore Nuzlocke videos, I have some sort of additional set of rules to make the hardcore Nuzlocke even harder than it already is. Usually it's a monotype run or some sort of theme that limits the Pokemon that I can catch. But in this video, it's just a plain old regular run-of-the-mill hardcore Nuzlocke. And there's a couple of reasons for that. For one, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are easily the hardest Pokemon games to Nuzlocke, outside of ROM hacks, of course. They're the only mainline Pokemon game where trainers before the post-game have fully EV trained Pokemon. Almost every named character in the game uses Pokemon with near-perfect IVs that have been strategically EV trained. In addition to that, the totem challenges in the Alola region pit you against very powerful totem Pokemon that often get Omni boosts at the start of the battle and can call upon allies to make the battle a two-on-one. So it requires a lot of strategy to complete even a regular hardcore Nuzlocke of these games. The other reason I didn't include any extra rules is because Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon are the only main series Pokemon games that I've never played. I wasn't a huge fan of Sun and Moon, and then when Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon came out, I just kinda didn't buy them. Honestly, I was content never having played these games and living in blissful ignorance. But then I got a DM from another Poketuber named Chaotic Meatball, who suggested that we both play Ultra Sun and see how well we do. So here we are with my first ever playthrough of Pokemon Ultra Sun. Just as a quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to reroll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Also, this challenge had a few extra rules specifically for Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Pokemon Ami was not allowed, but Z-moves were. I considered Ultra Beasts to be similar to Legendaries and were therefore banned. I also banned Island Scan and whatever SOS chaining is. As always, a full list of rules is in the description below. So without further ado, let's see how this goes. Naturally, I start the game by choosing my stu- wait, there's a cutscene. Okay, a little girl dressed like a widow who vacations at Martha's Vineyard is running away from some scientists. Oh look, okay, that spaceman wants to give her a hug, but she doesn't seem really into it. Okay, now her bag is glowing, and uh, oh, a, a title card. Very cinematic. Well, that was a very fun opening cutscene to what will surely be an immersive RPG. Anyways, naturally I start the game by cho- Oh, okay, there's another cutscene. Let's see. Zooming in on an island, that's an old lady, probably my mom. Okay, she has a Meowth, and now she's asking the Meowth to assist her with her parenting responsibilities. Okay, now it looks like we're seeing the world from Meowth's POV. I guess that's something I've always wanted in my Pokemon games. Okay, okay, now we're slowly panning through my room, Poliwhirl rug, Pikachu doll, pincer blankets. Seems like my character is a diehard Gen 1-er. You know what, let's just cut to picking my starter several minutes later. I can choose between Who, Mrar, and Bork Bork. Eventually, I pick Rowlet because it's the only starter that I like from this generation. Poplio belongs in the ocean, not dragging its stomach across miles of gravel following a 10-year-old around. And Litten evolves into Incineroar, who, uh, make, makes me uncomfortable. I name our new Rowlet Owlympics, and then our journey begins after several more minutes of dialogue. Before I have time to think though, I'm interrupted by my rival Hao, who wants a battle with the new Pokemon we just got. But as with many of the rivals in later Pokemon games, Hao graduated from the Weenie Hut School for Rivals, so he chooses a Poplio. Our Olympics also starts with Lafage, so it's pretty easy to take him out. As a note, there's about 500 major and minor battles with characters that some might call important if you're using the loosest definition of the word important, so for the sake of time, I just really can't cover all of them. So this is going to be the last fight that you see with Hao for quite some time, because most of them are pretty easy. Here's a list of other major battles that I'll be skipping. Okay, now it's time for encounters. In Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon, Route 1 is massive. Using normal Nuzlocke rules, you'd only be allowed to get one encounter from Route 1, since even though there are different sub-areas, they all show up as Route 1 in the Pokemon stat page. This means that your Route 1 encounter is your starter. Normally, this would be fine, you just gotta wait until the next route. Unfortunately, there is a battle in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon with the head of the trainer school on Route 1, and you can't leave Route 1 until you beat her, and she has a Pokemon with a guaranteed super effective move against your starter. In my case, she has a Litten, 
So with a hardcore level cap, it's virtually impossible to beat this trainer with just your starter. So I've decided to make an exception here, which from my understanding is pretty standard. Although Owlympics is my encounter for Route 1 proper, I catch a Slowpoke from Route 1 Howly Outskirts, and an Alolan Meowth from Route 1 Trainer School. I named the Slowpoke Spectator, and I named the Meowth Gatlin. With these new encounters, Spectator in particular, the head of the Trainer School is fairly easy to take out. Litten goes down to just three water guns. Next we head to Haoli City and find a Magnamite. As usual, I won't cover every single encounter in the game, but we end up using a wide range of Pokemon, so I'll mention every single one that will make an appearance later down the road. I name our new Magnamite Shotput, and he joins the team. Now it's time to take on the first Trial Captain, which is the Alola region's version of Gym Leaders. Each Trial Captain makes you do a Trial Challenge, where you face a giant Totem Pokemon. The level of the next Totem Pokemon is usually what determines the current level cap, but occasionally, before doing the Trial Challenge, you have to fight the Trial Captain. If all of this seems confusing to you, that's because it is. This game has so much stuff to do, and deciding how to set up a Nuzlocke around it is actually really annoying. But either way, Alima isn't too much of a problem, and we're able to win the battle. Next up, I catch a Makuhita from Route 2 and name him JV Captain. Even that we have the normal type trial coming up, this is a pretty awesome catch. I also catch a Psyduck from Sandy Cave and name her Katie Leducky. And from Haoli Cemetery, I catch a Zubat. I name him Sotomayor. And now it's time for Alima's trial. Trials usually start with some type of minor children's puzzle where you have to battle some Pokemon. Because there are certain trials where you can't actually leave after you've started, I decided that it's okay if a Pokemon levels past the level cap during the trial. So, by the time we get to the first Totem Pokemon, a massive Gumshoes, whose defense has been buffed, JV Captain has already gained a level. During the trial, we also picked up the TM for Brick Break, so this ends up being a fairly easy fight. JV Captain is pre-poisoned, since he has guts, so after tanking a tackle, a Brick Break nearly knocks out Gumshoes in one shot. Gumshoes then calls a Young Goose as an ally, so now it's a two-on-one. I switch to Shot Put and tank another tackle. Then a Magnet Bomb kills Gumshoes. Two more Magnet Bombs finish off the little Young Goose, and with that, we've completed our first trial. There's only one trial on Melee Melee Island, so now it's time to take on the Island Kahuna in the first Grand Trial, which is basically just like a battle against a gym leader. So that becomes the new level cap now. There's more to the island to explore before that though, so we get a few more encounters. In Verdant Cave, I catch a Noibat and name her Simone Biles. In Melee Melee Meadows, I catch a Caterpie and name him Michael Phelps. And lastly, on Route 3, I catch a Mankey and name him Judo. Now, I don't have a particularly elegant transition into this next bit because I'm missing a bit of footage, but before fighting the Island Kahuna Hala, who specializes in fighting types, I figured that it would be good to get the TM for Roost to teach it to my flying types. In order to get the TM for Roost, you need to fight Ace Trainer Makana on Route 3, who will only fight you after you've fought every other trainer on the route. There's a few of these Ace Trainers throughout the game, and each one will give you a TM for beating them. Now, viewer, as I've already said, I've never played Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon before. If I had played these games before, I would have known that these Ace Trainers are very, very powerful. Not only do these trainers have Pokemon at pretty high levels relative to where they are in the game, their Pokemon also usually have max IVs, and they're usually also fully EV trained, and they usually have pretty strong moves. And in the case of Ace Trainer Makana's Butterfree, it also has its hidden ability, which is Tinted Lens, meaning that its not very effective moves do double damage. I knew exactly none of this. So imagine my surprise when I switch in Shot Put into a resisted Silverwind and lose over half my health. But that's not even the fun part. The fun part is that this Butterfree also got the 10% Omni boost from Silverwind, meaning that this Tinted Lens, Perfect IV, Max Special Attack EV's Butterfree is juiced up and ready to destroy my team. I believe that the scientific term for this is that I am f***ed. Now fortunately, this Butterfree only knows Silverwind and Roost. Since Silverwind only has 5 PP, it can only hit me 4 more times. So I'm unlikely to wipe here, but no one on my team can really handle a plus 1 Tinted Lens Silverwind, except maybe Sotomayor the Zubat. Viewers with weak constitution may want to look away for this next bit. It's a massacre. A bloodbath. Butterfree is Mothra, and my poor Pokémon are expendable civilians. Bits and pieces of my Pokémon are being scattered across the battlefield left and right as Silver Winds tear through them. Sotomayor is able to tank a single Silver Wind since he quad resists it, so it's only Judo, Gatlin, and Spectator that fall. 
Rest well, you beautiful souls. Thank you for your sacrifice. Once Butterfree is out of Silver Winds, I just stall it out of Roosts, and then a combination of Recoil from Struggle and Pex from Olympics finish it off. That was brutal. Well, when Bruce Wayne fell into a cave full of bats as a child, he faced his greatest nightmare by becoming the Batman. So after I lost half my team to a Butterfree, I decided to face my nightmare by evolving Michael Phelps into Metapod and then into a Butterfree of my own. And with that, it's time to face Hala for the Melee Melee Island Grand Trial. But since I'm basically a flying type trainer right now, this is pretty easy. Hala leads Machop and I lead Michael Phelps. Machop uses Focus Energy and then I put it to sleep with the Sleep Powder. Hala uses a full restore as I hit a gust. So then I hit another Sleep Powder. And then another gust knocks it out. Makuhita is second and immediately hits Michael Phelps with a fake out. Then I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. I hit it with a gust and then Makuhita wakes up and hits an arm thrust. So I put it back to sleep. And then I go for a roost as it sleeps. A final gust knocks out the Makuhita. And then the last Pokemon for Hala is Crabrawler. He outspeeds to hit a pursuit, but then I put it to sleep with Sleep Powder. Then I roost to heal up. Crabrawler wakes up and hits another pursuit, but two gusts from Michael Phelps are enough to knock it out. And that wins us a pretty easy grand trial. With Hala defeated, we can now go to Akala Island. But first I go to 10 Carrot Hill and catch a Carbink, AKA the carry of this run. Carbink is an absolute defensive tank and he's cute as heck too. Welcome to the team, medalist. On Akala Island, Olympics evolves into Dartrix. Then I get an Eevee egg from the daycare. It hatches in Paniola Town, and I name him Ashton Eaton. For now, I just put him into the box until I decide what I want to evolve him into. Then I catch a Picky Peck on Route 4, and I name her Javelin. I also catch a Mudbray at Paniola Ranch. Unfortunately, she doesn't have the ability Stamina, which is quite good. So I just name her Sprinter. That's a little bit of running humor for my fellow runners out there. Then Picky Peck evolves into Trombeak, and now it's time to take on Lana's Water Trial. Lana's Trial requires me to fight a Totem Araquanid, which gets a speed boost. It's also raining, so thanks to the rain and Araquanid's Water Bubble ability, its water moves do stupid amounts of damage. I lead Michael Phelps and instantly put the Araquanid to sleep. Annoyingly, it can still call allies in its sleep, so a tiny Dupiter comes out. On the next turn, I do a silly dance, and Michael Phelps uses his flying type Z move, Supersonic Strike, which does a good chunk of damage. Unfortunately, Araquanid wakes up and hits Michael Phelps with a bubble. Baby Dupiter also hits a bubble. That's really good damage considering that bubble has a base power of 40. Anyways, I put the Araquanid back to sleep and get hit with another bubble from Dupiter, which thankfully doesn't crit. On the next turn, I go for a roost as Araquanid mercifully stays asleep and I get hit by another bubble from Dupiter. I go for another roost, and luckily Araquanid stays asleep again. Then I go for a gust, but Araquanid hangs on with just a sliver, and then it wakes up. So a double bubble from Araquanid and Baby Dupiter take out Michael Phelps. You'd think that the Pokemon named Michael Phelps wouldn't be felled by water, but so it goes. Rest well, buddy. I bring out Trombeak, who kills the Araquanid with a Pluck. And then after getting hit by a bubble, Pluck finishes off the Baby Dupiter. And that's the water trial completed. During Lana's trial, we got the ability to surf on a Lepra, so that lets me get a few more encounters. From Brooklet Hill, I catch a Surskit and name her Skater. From Mele Mele Sea, I catch a Mantike and name her Surfer. And from Kalei Bay, I catch a Magikarp and name him Diver. From here, I have to do whatever the hell this is. There's a guy that I've definitely never seen before wearing some sort of Mucha Lucha mask, as well as Gladion and Hal and we each have one Pokemon in what looks like this feral cage match free-for-all. I'll be honest, I didn't really pay attention when they were babbling through the cutscenes that led up to the battle. And the battle also started immediately after the cutscene, which I unwittingly activated by walking into the building. So I was not remotely prepared for this. Sprinter happened to be at the front of the party when I walked into the building, so he's the one that comes out. I was told by my Twitch chat that the battle would end as soon as one of the other Pokemon gets knocked out. So I go for Bulldozes to knock out the Rockruff. Turns out that Rockruff has Protect, and it uses it a lot. So it takes way longer to kill it than it should have. Had I just focused on Double Kicking Type Null, I definitely could have ended this battle much faster. I'm able to kill the Rockruff after two turns of Protect stalling, but unfortunately, Type Null finishes off Sprinter before the battle ends. So, it sucks. Rest well, little cow. You will be missed. Well, that was my bad but that's what I get for not knowing anything about what's happening in this game. But let's not beat a dead cow. Time to move on. 
I catch a wishy-washy on Route 7 and name him Swim Team. Or is it them? I don't really understand Wishiwashi's whole deal. Like, do I own the entire school of fish that form the monster Wishiwashi? Or do I just own a single Wishiwashi, and then every time its schooling ability activates, a bunch of other Wishiwashi in the nearest body of water fly to the battlefield like Thor's hammer? Or does the main Wishiwashi temporarily create additional Wishiwashi out of thin air and form a school that way? Do those newly created Wishiwashi have thoughts? Do they have aspirations, hopes, and dreams? Are their sentient minds just trapped in their bodies that they have no control of, forever doomed to be an expendable cog in a war machine? Really unclear. Anyways, I also catch a Salandite in Wella Volcano Park, but it's male, so it can't evolve. I name it DNF. Then I start training for Kiawe's trial. Training in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon is incredibly painful. Because of the new EXP mechanics, training on low-level Pokemon takes forever. But because most routes have a wide variety of Pokemon, training in an area of reasonably leveled Pokemon can be pretty dangerous. For example, while training JV Captain, I run into a Magby. I try to run, but JV Captain is too slow. So Magby locks me in with a fire spin, and so now I can't escape or switch. So I try to kill the Magby with a brick break, but it leaves it with a sliver. So then the wild Magby calls another Magby. And just like that, JV Captain is dead. To a wild Magby. I didn't actually get the footage of her dying, but, but yeah, JV Captain dies. I also accidentally lose Swim Team the Wishy Washy during some training, which I also didn't record. I just wasn't paying attention and lost him to a quick attack from a Fletchling. So that's now 7 deaths, and we aren't even off the second island. Losing one Pokemon to a baby Pokemon, and another to a foreign regional bird Pokemon, was really the one-two punch that made me realize that I need to slow down and be a bit more cautious. So, for the rest of the game, I make sure to read walkthroughs before each chunk of the game so that I know exactly what's coming and when. From here, Sotomayor evolves into Golbat, and Diver evolves into Gyarados. Now it's time for Kiawe's Fire Trial. The puzzle involves me watching a lowland Marowak dance around in a circle, and then… honestly I have no idea. For the life of me, I could not understand what I was supposed to do during this trial. I just didn't read the cutscene that explained the instructions. There's so many freaking cutscenes in this game, and it's really impossible to tell which ones are important. Thankfully, Twitch chat held my hand and guided my toddler-sized brain through it, which led me to the Totem Alolan Marowak. This thing gets plus two speed at the start of battle, so it's able to outspeed Sotomayor. It also uses a cheeky detect turn one to block my attack, and then call a Salazzle for support. Salazzle moves first and uses Torment, and then Marowak hits a nasty flame wheel, but then Sotomayor uses Thief to steal the Marowak's Thick Club. This will make it do significantly less damage on subsequent turns. Then I switch to Diver, who gets off an attack drop with Intimidate, so the Flame Burst and the Flame Wheel from Salazzle and Marowak really don't do much on the switch. On the next turn, Marowak detects, Salazzle hits a Poison Gas, and Diver knocks out the Salazzle with a Supersonic Strike. Then I switch to Metalist, who shakes off a Hex like it was nothing. Then Marowak and Metalist just trade attacks back and forth until Marowak's Cursed ability activates, disabling Metalist's only attacking move. So I set up a Reflect as Marowak keeps using Hex. Then I use Sharpen until Smackdown is no longer disabled. And then a final Smackdown finishes off the Marowak. And that's Kiawe's trial completed. Look at how happy Metalist is. He's so cute! Immediately after Kiawe's trial, Sotomayor evolves into Crobat, a consistently incredible Pokemon to have during a Nuzlocke. The same can also be said about Gyarados, obviously, so despite 7 deaths, I've still got a lot of good encounters remaining. And there's more to come. From Route 5, I catch an Alolan Diglett and name him Discus. Then Skater evolves into Masquerain, so now I have two Pokémon with Intimidate, which is pretty nice. Now it's time for Mallow's Grass Trial, which pits you against a Totem Lorantis. Now this Lorantis trial is notorious for being really difficult, with many people saying that it's nearly impossible to beat it without losing at least one Pokémon. But those people clearly don't know what a Zubat is, because Zubat has quad resistance to every single one of Lorantis' attacks, so it's not going to be doing much to our Crobat. Now, the ally Pokémon can be a bit of an issue, but if you damage Lorantis by at least one-third of its health on the first turn, which can be done with a Cross Poison, it'll call Comfy before it calls Kecleon. Comfy's only attacking move is Magical Leaf, which doesn't do anything to Crobat either. It does have Flower Shield to boost Lorantis' defense, and Floral Healing to heal the Lorantis, which is a bit annoying since Lorantis also knows Synthesis, but by slapping a Scope Lens onto Crobat and spamming Cross Poison, you can make your chance of getting a critical hit go up to 
You might not get as lucky as I do, where I actually get three critical hits in a row, but a well-prepared Crobat makes this pretty hard to lose. That's Malo's trial completed. Now it's time for Akala Island's grand trial against the Island Kahuna Olivia. But first I have to do a bit of preparation. I catch a Steeny from the Lush Jungle and name her Allison Felix. I also catch a Love Disc on Route 9 and name her Archery. And then I catch a Wingull from Akala Outskirts and name him Sailing. Sailing won't have the ability Drizzle when he evolves into Pelipper, which sucks, but he'll still be useful later on in the run. Then, Discus evolves into a Doug Trio with some beautiful locks. And so now, it's time for the battle against Olivia. She leads Anorith, and I lead Metalist. Anorith uses Metal Claw, which is quad super effective against Metalist, but because critical hits are times 1.5 instead of times 2 in these later generations, this is always safe. So Metalist is able to safely set up a Stealth Rocks. Then I switch to Shot Put, who tanks a Metal Claw. Anorith uses Bug Bite as Shot Put hits a Thunder Wave. Then Olivia uses a Full Heal as I set up a Reflect. So I go for another Thunder Wave, but I miss. A third Thunder Wave connects though. Then I switch to Skater, who gets an Intimidate drop as Anorith gets fully paralyzed. Then I switch to Archery as Anorith uses Smackdown. Then I use Lucky Chant so that Anorith can't get a critical hit and bypass the attack drops. This allows me to safely hit Anorith with a Charm on the next turn, so now it's at minus 3. Then I switch to Discus, who is now pretty safe to set up workups and raise our attack. Anorith is doing very little damage with its attacks, and Discus is gaining HP back with leftovers. Discus also knows Protect, so I can safely gain additional HP back from leftovers if I need to. After I get 6 workups off, Discus takes out the Anorith with a Bulldoze. Lyleep comes in next, and I instantly use Protect to gain some additional HP back from leftovers, though at this point it doesn't really matter. Thanks to Metalist's hard work setting up Stealth Rocks at the beginning of the game, Bulldoze is a guaranteed kill on the Lyleep from this HP. So last is Lycanroc, who we outspeed and kill with a final bulldoze. And that's Olivia defeated. Soon after this, Shot Put evolves into Magneton. After that, we dock at the island of Ula Ula. There's a good deal of encounters here, but the only one that matters is this big girl from Route 10. I name her Judo before realizing that we actually have a dead Mankey named Judo. So I change her name to Taekwondo a little bit later. Taekwondo the Raticate will be important later. Now it's time to take on Sophocles' Electric Trial, which pits us against a Toga de Maru. It gets a plus 2 defense stat at the start of the game, but ground moves are still going to be doing a lot to it. I lead Diver to get the Intimidate attack drop. This also baits a Zing Zap, which gives me a free switch into Discus. Then Toga de Maru calls Skarmory for support. From here, it's a series of using Protect and Bulldoze to try to kill the Toga de Maru. What's annoying is that Skarmory uses Torment so that I can't actually use the same move twice in a row and Togedemaru also spams Spiky Shield, rather unpredictably I might add. And Discus isn't exactly the bulkiest Pokemon, so even though we resist Steel Wing and Iron Head, it's not like we're taking zero damage. At one point, I switch in Diver to get another Intimidate off, but I can only do that once because Skarmory set up Stealth Rocks. So it's pretty hard to get the timing right, and this ends up taking a lot longer than I thought. I actually get pretty close to losing Discus, thanks to Togedemaru getting a flinch with Iron Head, and Torment trapping me into a pretty unfortunate series of hitting into Protects. But a few turns later, I get off a workup for free, and then two more Bulldozes knock out Togedemaru. The last thing to do is to switch to Shot Put, and then knock out the Skarmory with a Charge Beam. Well actually, it survives a Charge Beam, but thanks to the special attack boost we get, a Flash Cannon finishes it off on the next turn, completing the trial. Next up, we need to take on Team Skull Leader Guzma, this is one of the few non-totem fights that I'll show, because I think it's hilarious. Fun fact, Guzma's incredibly intimidating Galissapod can be completely cheesed by any Pokemon with the ability Water Absorb. And guess who has the ability Water Absorb? That's right, our level 17 Mantyke named Surfer. So Galissapod only knows Sucker Punch, Razor Shell, and First Impression. First Impression is similar to Fake Out in that it only works on the first turn of the battle. Sucker Punch only works if you use an attacking move. And of course, Razor Shell can't do anything to Surfer because of Water Absorb. So by spamming Protect until Galissapod runs out of Sucker Punch PP, we can safely and slowly whittle down the Galissapod with Wing Attacks and Confuse Ray. And what's funny is that because Galissapod hits himself in Confusion to go under 50%, his ability Emergency Exit doesn't activate. So Surfer is able to fully knock out Galissapod all on her own. After that, Guzma's second and last Pokemon is Masquerain, which actually hits surprisingly hard with 252 special attack EVs. Look at how much this Air Slash does to Diver on the switch-in. So after that, I switch to Shot Put. 
Then I hit it with a charge beam, but a bug buzz puts us in critical hit range. So I need to switch to Metalist, and then I finally finish it off with an Ancient Power. After this, Ula Ula opens up, and we get a few more encounters. But the only one that matters is Houndoom, who I seem to be using in a lot of my challenges lately. He's such a great doggo. I name him Skeleton, and we'll use him later. After that, Shotput evolves into Magnezone, and then Olympix evolves into Decidueye. Then it's time for Acerola's Ghost Trial against a Totem Mimikyu. This can be pretty tricky. Because of Mimikyu's ability, we can never one-shot it. Mimikyu also gets an Omni Boost at the start of the battle, which makes things pretty scary. Fortunately, I have a plan. I lead Skater, who gets off an Intimidate to bring Mimikyu's attack back down to neutral. This allows Skater to survive a play rough, even if it crits, so that she's able to U-turn to break Mimikyu's disguise and get shot put in safely. Now in Sword and Shield, when Mimikyu's disguise breaks, it loses 1 8 of its HP. I actually didn't know that this wasn't added until Gen 8, intentionally to debuff the ability. And I was kind of banking on that 1 8 because it would have guaranteed that Shot Put can kill Mimikyu in one shot with a Corkscrew Crash Z move. Instead, Mimikyu hangs on with essentially 1 HP. Fortunately, we're still able to finish it off on the next turn with a Flash Cannon, and there was no real harm done. But that could have gone a lot worse if the ally Bayonet had used Curse, or if Mimikyu got a crit or something like that. Anyways, after that, Diver comes in and just finishes off the Bayonet with a Crunch, completing Acerola's Trial. From here, there's a whole lot of Team Skull stuff, including another fight with Guzma, but we'll skip all of that and most of the encounters. There are a few notable ones, though. From the thrifty Mega Mart, I catch a Shuppet. I would have preferred a Mimikyu, but a used Kleenex is fine too. I name him Shuttlecock. And, and, and a lot of people in Twitch chat didn't know this, so I just figured I'd mention it here as well for everybody. A shuttlecock is that little thing that you hit in badminton. But anyways, from Hyena Desert, I catch a Crocorock, and I name him Croc Climber. And then on Route 16, I catch a Scraggy, and I name her Vashtai. Kind of a cute little throwback to the Black 2 Dark Type Only Challenge, huh? They both have Moxie, too. From Ula Ula Meadows, I catch a Floet, and I name her Trampoline. Then, Vashtai evolves into Scrafty and Croc Climber evolves into Crocodile. And now it's time to take on the Ula Ula Island Kahuna, Nanu, for the third Grand Trial. He leads Sableye, and I lead Vashtai. I start with a Protect to avoid damage from Fake Out. Then I just start doing damage with Crunch, as Sableye retaliates with some weak Shadow Balls. A few turns of back and forth, and then Sableye goes down. Nanu sends out Crocorock second. It hits a very hard Earthquake, but then it goes down to a Brick Break. Nanu's Alolan Persian is last, and I start by protecting to avoid the fake out. And then, even though we're at pretty low health, I stay in because Persian really can't do much damage. We tank a power gem, and I hit a pretty hard brick break. Then I switch to Shot Put, who tanks another power gem. I won't survive a critical hit from Persian's Dark Type Z move though, so I switch to Metalist, who very easily tanks a non critical hit Black Hole Eclipse. So, after a turn of using Protect to recover HP from leftovers, Metalist finishes off Persian with an Ancient Power and that's Nanu defeated. Next up, it's time for all the stuff that goes down at the Aether Foundation. I decide to get Ashton Eaton the EV out of the box and evolve him into a Vaporeon so that I can use his Water Absorb ability in my last fight against Guzma, but I'm just gonna skip that fight as well. However, I will show the fight against Lusamine, who... wait... is evil? The lady dressed in all white in charge of a cryptic futuristic company is evil? That... that is quite the revelation. An absolute plot twist. I'm, I'm really going to need to sit with that one for a second. My mind is, is blown. Wow, wow. Okay, well anyways, the fight against the ultra-secret villain Lusamine. She leads with a Pokemon that truly captures her villainy. Clefable. Look at how evil it is. I lead Shot Put, and then I instantly take out the Clefable with a Corkscrew Crash. Then Lopunny comes out. I assumed that it would be going for Fire Punch, but for some reason she just uses Thunder Punch, which does very little damage. So I'm able to get off a Discharge, which paralyzes Lopunny. So I click Discharge again, and then Lopunny goes for Thunder Punch again. Weird. Beware is out next. So, predicting a Drain Punch, I switch to Olympics, but then Lusamine goes for Dual Chop instead. Again, that makes zero sense going into Shot Put. No other AI in this game is this bad and unpredictable. On the next turn, I miss a Toxic as Beware hits another Dual Chop. So now Olympics is in the red, and I gotta switch to Metalist. But of course, Lusamine has switched to Zen Headbutt for some reason, so we take a decent chunk of damage instead of being immune to Dual Chop. I Protect for Leftovers Recovery, then I miss another Toxic. So, I Protect for some Recovery, and then I go for Toxic. But I miss a third 
time. What the hell? Well, I finally connect on the next turn. So from here, it's a classic toxic stall with protect as Lusamine continues to make insanely questionable move choices. Why is she ever using takedown here? The frustrating thing is that if I knew Beware was going to use Drain Punch, which is by far his strongest move into Metalist, I could safely switch to Olympics to stall without taking any damage. But I can't because Lusamine is being ridiculous. Eventually, I gotta switch to Diver, who actually gets hit pretty hard by a takedown on the switch. Because why wouldn't she use takedown? A final turn of toxic damage kills Beware, and then Lilligant comes out. Its only damaging move is Petal Dance, so I switch to Sotomayor. We get hit with a Teeter Dance, but a Lumberry cures the confusion. Unfortunately, Lilligant outspeeds and confuses us again, so Sotomayor hits himself in confusion. So I switch to Shot Put as Lilligant uses Petal Dance for a huge chunk of damage. Then I switch back to Sotomayor. Because Lilligant actually has the ability Own Tempo, it doesn't get confused by the end of Petal Dance, so it gets off another Teeter Dance, but fortunately this time we break through and knock out the Lilligant with an Acrobatics. That could have been really bad. Last is Milotic. One would think that she'll use Hydro Pump, since that's the most damage, but who knows at this point. I switch to Ashton Eaton, who gets hit with an Icy Wind. At least that kind of makes sense. Then Lusamine uses a useless Hydro Pump as I hit a Toxic. And from here, it's another Toxic stall. This battle was so stupid. Given that basically every other trainer in the game has pretty good AI, I have to assume that Lusamine's AI being dumber than a sack of bricks is intentional which canonically may explain why Lily sucks at using Pokemon in battle. Her mom sucks too. If that's really why, I guess that's kinda cool, but either way, this made for a really obnoxious battle. Anyways, that's Lusamine defeated, but there is just so much story left. Before all of that though, we do get to take a side trip to Pawnee Island. Once we're there, I get a shiny stone and evolve Trampoline into Florges. Then, in Pawnee Breaker Coast, I catch a Gastrodon and name her Missy Franklin. Then Shuttlecock evolves into a Bayonet. And with that, it's time to fight the Totem Kamo'o in Vast Pawnee Canyon. This thing is truly terrifying. It gets an Omni Boost at the start of the battle, so it can hit insanely hard and also call Noivern or Caesar as an ally Pokemon depending on its health. But I have a plan. I lead Gyarados to lower its attack with Intimidate. This baits Kamo'o to use Thunder Punch, which gives me a safe switch into Missy Franklin. This also means that Kamo'o calls Noivern, which is better than dealing with Caesar. I protect for a turn just to bait out the moves, then I switch to Metalist, who's immune to Dragon Claw and takes minimal damage from Boom Burst. From here, the plan is to just Toxic the Kamo'o and then stall it out. But I accidentally target Noivern instead, which is amazingly stupid. I really don't know how I ever successfully finish any of these runs. Well, that does expose us to a few crits, and things can go really poorly if I miss Toxic on the next turn, but my mistake goes unpunished, and I'm able to hit the Kamo'o with a second Toxic following that mistake. Now the fun part. After stalling a turn of Toxic with Protect, I switch to Shuttlecock, who is immune to both Drain Punch from Kamo'o and Boom Burst from Noivern. Shuttlecock now baits Dragon moves from both Noivern and Kamo'o, so it's completely safe to switch back to Metalist. Repeating this over and over again would have been perfect had I not accidentally also poisoned Noivern. But because I did, it's gonna die before Kamo'o does, and then Kamo'o will call in Caesar, which I really don't want to have to deal with. So I just try to kill Kamo'o with a Dazzling Gleam, but it does very little thanks to a Rosalie Berry, and Kamo'o ends up surviving from poison with a Sliver, which allows him to call in Caesar. On the next turn, I protect to knock out the Kamo'o, but now we gotta deal with the Caesar. So I switch to Shot Put. Then I hit it with a Discharge, which does a huge chunk of damage. Caesar just uses Light Screen, so one more Discharge is all it takes to knock out the Caesar, winning us the battle, and completing the trial. Okay, let's get back to this riveting Ultra Space story. Long story short, this thing called Necrozma absorbs Solgaleo, which is the thing that digivolved from the cotton candy fluff that Lily was carrying around in her Lululemon bag. So I gotta take it down. Fortunately, Skeleton is able to make quick work of it with an Inferno Overdrive and then a Flamethrower. This causes it to open an Ultra Wormhole, so the people with a rare skin disease let me mount their Lunala so that I can ride it to Ultra Megalopolis, sure, to fight Ultra Necrozma and save the world. Or something. However, Ultra Necrozma is iconically incredibly difficult. Not only is it a Pokemon with 167 base attack and special attack, it also gets an Omni Boost at the start of the battle, and it's level 60, which is well above our level cap of 54. So this is known as one of the hardest challenges in the game. Kind of. See, Ultra Necrozma, like most battles against AI, 
can be cheesed with the right Pokemon and the right strategies. One of these strategies utilizes a Fear Rattata. Fear Rattata is a rather gimmicky competitive set that involves using a level 1 Rattata that knows the moves Endeavor and Quick Attack and is equipped with a Focus Sash. The idea is to bring Rattata into the battle against a strong opponent. On the first turn, the opponent tries to knock out the Rattata in one shot, which activates Rattata's Focus Sash and lets it live with 1 HP. Rattata can then retaliate with Endeavor, which brings the opponent down to 1 HP as well. Then, on the next turn, the Rattata can use a Priority Quick Attack to knock out the last health point of its opponent. Of course, there's a lot of counterplays to this strategy, but against the right opponent, it works perfectly, and Ultra Necrozma is the right opponent. And while we don't have a Fear Rattata, we do have an Alolan Raticate named Taekwondo. So, we can collect the Soul Focus Sash available to us before the postgame and give it to Taekwondo. I can then also teach Taekwondo Endeavor at level 44. And though I can't access the Movery Learner to reteach Taekwondo a Quick Attack, she does know Sucker Punch, which is another priority move that we can use to snipe the Ultra Necrozma's last point of HP. So instead of using a Fear Rattata, I'm going to be using a Fesper Raticate. But there's one tiny wrinkle to this plan. Taekwondo's ability is Hustle. Hustle is a stupid, stupid ability that ups the power of your attacking moves at the expense of accuracy. This means that Taekwondo has a 20% chance to miss Endeavor or Sucker Punch. If she misses Sucker Punch, that's okay. I can just finish off the Ultra Necrozma with another priority move from another team member. But if she misses Endeavor, it's very likely that I wipe. 20% to have to restart the run. Now I'm sure that me gambling about a month of my life working on this run would make for some pretty thrilling content. But instead, I just decide to take the safer option. There's an item in these later generations called the Ability Capsule, which allows you to change the ability of your Pokémon if they have two abilities available. Fortunately, Alolan Raticate can have Hustle or Gluttony, so by using an Ability Capsule on Taekwondo, I can remove the 20% chance of wiping and give her the ability Gluttony. In order to get an Ability Capsule though, you need 100 battle points, which thankfully you can get relatively quickly by doing the Mantine Surf minigame. So, after an afternoon of riding the waves, I get an Ability Capsule, hide it in a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and then feed it to Taekwondo. With that, we're ready to take on Ultra Necrozma. I wish I could somehow make this suspenseful, but as long as I push the correct buttons, this is unlosable. Fortunately, my idiocy doesn't get in the way. I click the right buttons, and it goes off without a hitch. Step aside, Remy. There's a new badass rat in town. Sure, anyone can cook, but can anyone best an all-powerful alien monster from another dimension? F*** you, Remy. Okay, with the world and multiverse or whatever finally saved, we can finish up the last few island trials. Mina's trial is next. I start by fighting her. Then I need to go around Alola and fight four of the previous trial captains to collect some flower petals. In theory, this is kind of a cool way to tie the world together and bring characters back from the start of the game to really bring a sense of finality to the journey. In practice though, it's insanely tedious, at least when I've been doing a Nuzlocke of these games on stream for over a month. So I'm just gonna skip all these fights, because they're pretty straightforward and not all that difficult. But what is difficult is the Totem Rabambi that attacks you at the end of her trial. The thing gets plus two to all of its stats. It's also level 55, Unfortunately, the Pawnee Island Kahuna's level cap is level 54, so I'm actually stuck at a slight level disadvantage. I lead Sotomayor, which does at least resist all of Rabombi's attacks. Rabombi starts with a Quiver Dance as Sotomayor hits a Toxic, which at least is guaranteed to hit when used by a Poison type. Rabombi then calls in Pelipper at the end of the turn. From here, things get a little tricky. The idea is to protect Stall and do damage with super effective moves. But if I protect and Rabambi uses another Quiver Dance, I might not be able to protect Stall for long enough. I just don't know if Rabambi will go for a second Quiver Dance here. But I do decide to risk it and go for an Acid Downpour. Rabambi does indeed go for a second Quiver Dance. So, Crobot's able to fire off a nasty Acid Downpour, which doesn't kill Rabambi, but hopefully Protect and Toxic damage are enough to finish it off. Unfortunately, Rabambi hangs on with just a sliver. Pelipper has also gained 2 stockpile and is now threatening to hit us with a 200 base power spit up. I could risk the double protect, but that's only a 50% chance of being successful. Instead, I just decide to switch to shot put. And then for some reason, Rabambi just throws the game and goes for another quiver dance. Pelipper also goes for a third stockpile. And then Rabambi dies to poison damage. 
So last is the Pelipper, who does hit a fairly hard rain-boosted Scald before going down to a Discharge. But even with a crit, Sturdy always guarantees us the win at that point. It would have been pretty embarrassing if our Electric-type got knocked out by a Water-type. Anyways, that's the final trial completed. Next up is our fourth and final Grand Trial against the Pawnee Island Kahuna Hapu. So I head to Exeggutor Island to challenge this weird-looking Animal Crossing villager. What the hell is this thing? Like, what's with her nose? Why does she look like a scarecrow? W whatever. She leads Golurk, so I lead Croc Climber and one-shot it with a Black Hole Eclipse. Then Hapu sends out Gastrodon, so I switch to Sailing, who has now evolved into a Pelipper. I protect with Sailing to get some HP back with Leftovers, and then I set up a Mist. This lets me switch to Olympics without risking an accuracy drop from Muddy Water. From here, I use Workup and stay healthy with Roost until the Mist wears off. Then I kill the Gastrodon with a Leaf Blade. Mudsdale comes out, but thanks to the Workup boost, the Hefty Cow goes down to a single Leaf Blade. Last is Flygon, so at least the Scarecrow does have some decent taste in Pokemon. Olympics tanks a Dragon Breath and then hits a Spirit Shackle that leaves Flygon with a Sliver. A Leaf Blade would have actually killed it, since it's 90 base power in this game instead of 70 base power, but I didn't remember that, so I thought that Spirit Shackle at 80 base power would do more damage. Fortunately, on the next turn, Hapu just uses a Hyper Potion, and then a Leaf Blade finishes it off, winning us the battle, and completing the final Grand Trial. All that's left to do is take on the Elite Four at the top of Mount Lanakila. I do have to get up there, which does require a final battle against Gladion, but since I've been skipping his fights anyways, let's just skip this one too. It's not that difficult. What is difficult, apparently, is this completely avoidable trainer in the cave of Mount Lanakila. She has a Milotic, and since she's a veteran trainer, her Pokemon are fully EV trained, so this thing hits really hard. I try to pivot out shot put with Volt Switch, thinking that I'm fast enough, but I completely misread Milotic's speed stat in my trainer document, which means that Milotic is able to outspeed and kill shot put with a Hydro Pump. Shot put has been really invaluable in this run, and he would have been incredibly useful in the Elite Four. So seeing him get killed off like this in such an unceremonious manner is really upsetting. Especially because Olympics is able to just easily come in, outspeed, and kill Milotic in one shot with a Leaf Blade. This was completely avoidable. Rest well, shot put. Well, with that, we get to the Elite Four, which is probably one of the strongest Elite Fours ever assembled in any Pokemon game. All these trainers have fully EV trained Pokemon, so this is going to be pretty tough. After hours of theory crafting, here's the team I came up with leveled up to match the level cap of the Elite Four's highest level Pokemon. Okay, let's see if we've got what it takes. First on the chopping block is Molain, the Steel-type trainer. He leads Klefki, and I lead Croc Climber. Klefki is a bit annoying because it sets up Reflect. This means an Earthquake doesn't kill it. So on the next turn, I use Brick Break to break the Reflect, but unfortunately, Klefki survives with a Sliver. Molain uses a Full Restore on the next turn, so a follow-up Brick Break doesn't kill either. So, Klefki gets up another Reflect and survives another Earthquake. But a final Brick Break knocks out the Klefki and breaks the Reflect. This also triggers Moxie. And from here, it's a good old fashioned Moxie sweep. Well, kind of. Metagross goes down to an Earthquake. As does Bisharp. But then a Lowland Dug Trio comes out, and he's able to outspeed me. So I switch to Diver to dodge a Fissure. Then a Hydro Vortex kills the Dug Trio in one shot. Last for Molain is Magnezone, so I switch to Croc Climber on a Thunderbolt. Then I use Fling to throw a King's Rock at the Magnezone, which causes it to flinch and breaks it sturdy. So, a final Earthquake knocks out the Magnezone, winning us the battle. One down, three to go. But that was by far the easiest of the four. Next is Olivia, who is back for vengeance after being cheesed by a workup Doug Trio. She leads Armaldo, and I lead Missy Franklin. Armaldo hits a pretty hard X Scissors, but I retaliate with a strong Scald. I go for a Protect to recover HP with Leftovers, but I get punished and Olivia heals Armaldo for free. So I go for a Protect on the next turn. Then I go for another Scald. Luckily, this one burns because we were at risk to a critical hit from X Scissors. But now, it's safe to just Protect and use Recover until the Armaldo dies from burn damage. So Armaldo goes down and Missy is at full health. Next is Crawdily, so I switch to Sotomayor who gets tickled by an Energy Ball. Then I hit Crawdily with a 100% accurate Toxic as Sotomayor gets hit by a Rock Tomb. Then it's time for just another cheeky Toxic Stall. Toxic Stall isn't that reliable because the enemies often use healing items, but if you time it right, or if you're bulky enough to fully Toxic Stall the enemy twice, then it's a pretty great strategy. Crawdily goes down a few turns later, and then Gigalith comes out. So I switch back to Missy, and then I go for a Toxic. Look, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Also, Missy is incredible at Toxic Stall because she has access to recovery. 
so even when Olivia uses a full restore on Gigalith, we're still able to take it down and stay at full HP. Fourth is Probopass, and although I can't poison it, Probopass does very little damage to Missy with any of its attacks. So even though it sets up a Sandstorm to buff its special defense, we're able to take it out with a few Scalds. And because we get another burn, Probopass actually goes down with Missy remaining at full HP. So last is Lycanroc, but now it's time for another Toxic Stall. This is slightly scary because Rock Climb can confuse, but thankfully it doesn't and Toxic connects. Missy does get confused a few turns later, but at that point the battle is over. I can switch into Olympics during our Rock Climb, Stall with Protect, and then switch to Metalist on a Crunch. With that, the Lycanroc falls, and that's Olivia defeated. Third is Kahili, the Flying-type Elite Four member. I'm not sure what her whole deal is. She likes golf, I guess? I don't know. Anyway, she leads with Freedom Burb, and I lead Metalist. Freedom Burb hits us with a Brave Bird as I set up a Stealth Rocks. Then I go for a Protect for Leftovers Recovery. On the next turn, we get hit by another Brave Bird, and then I hit a Power Gem. Then it's another Protect for Leftovers Recovery, and lastly, a final Power Gem knocks out Freedom Burb, but Metalist isn't looking too healthy at this point. Kahili sends out Halucha, so I Protect for Recovery. Then I go for Toxic as Halucha hits a Poison Jab, which thankfully doesn't poison. Then it's another Protect. Then I switch to Sotomayor, who resists a Poison Jab. Then I switch to Missy, who gets hit hard by a Critical Hit Throat Chop. Then Halucha hits a Hard Flying Press, but Missy uses Recovery, and then the poison damage finishes off the Halucha. So next is Mandibuzz. Mandibuzz uses Flatter, but fortunately I break through the confusion and hit a Toxic. On the next turn, Mandibuzz hits a hard Brave Bird, and Missy comes in clutch and gets off a Recover. She's less clutch on the next turn though, where she hits herself in confusion trying to get off a Protect, and then get hit hard by a Critical Hit Brave Bird. Yikes. Mandibuzz also falls into the red due to the poison damage, so Kahili is going to heal. I stay in as Mandibuzz goes for a full restore, but Missy hits herself in confusion. Bad luck. I switch to Metalist to tank a Brave Bird, then I go for a Protect for recovery. It looks like Mandibuzz is going for Flatter here, so I stay in, get hit by Flatter, and then hit myself in confusion. Bad luck times two. Mandibuzz should now use Bone Meringue to hit Metalist for super effective damage, so I switch into Diver. But instead of using Bone Meringue, she uses Brave Bird, which crits. Bad luck times three. This Mandibuzz is just ravaging my team. Okay, well, I switch back to Metalist to tank a Brave Bird. Then I protect for recovery, and it looks like Mandibuzz is just going for Brave Birds now. So I tank a Brave Bird and hit it with a Toxic. And now we should be okay. Our Protect heals us up and does poison damage to Mandibuzz. Then Metalist gets hit by a Flatter, but is finally able to break through and hit a Power Gem. With the Flatter boost, that and poison damage are enough to knock out this incredibly annoying bird. But now Two Cannon comes out, and this thing is terrifying. It has Skill Link, an ability that makes multi-hit moves always land their max number of hits. It also knows Rock Blast and Bullet Seed. So I'd expect it to use Bullet Seed here, but for some reason it goes for Beak Blast as I protect. I kind of forgot that I was still confused, so getting that protect off was incredibly lucky. The plan was to switch Sotomayor in on a Bullet Seed, but since Two Cannon isn't going for that move, I'm not sure what to do. I decide to stay in with Metalist. For some reason, Two Cannon uses Screech, which Metalist is immune to thanks to Clear Body. Metalist also lands a Toxic through Confusion, so I guess this good luck is kind of evening out the bad luck. Next, I switch to Olympics because he has a Koba Berry to survive a Flying type attack, but Kahili uses a Full Heal. This Full Heal crap is pretty annoying, I'm not gonna lie. I try to see if I can waste two cannons flying type Z move by going for a protect, but it just goes for Screech instead. So I switch to Metalist, who is immune to Screech. And then I use protect for recovery and to scout out that two cannon is using Beak Blast. So I stay in and go for Toxic. But then two cannon goes for a Z move, Supersonic Strike. It does do a decent amount of damage because it crits, but it's still not enough to take out the god that is Metalist the Carbink. He also fires off a Toxic. Then we use our last protect PP to dodge a Beak Blast, then I switch to Sotomayor, and thankfully Beak Blast doesn't crit, so Sotomayor survives. This lets me protect for more toxic damage, but now Two Cannon is in the red, so Kahili is going to heal. Fortunately, this finally gives me a safe switch into Croc Climber, and then I'm finally able to outspeed this miserable thing and kill it with a Continental Crush Z move in one shot. Good freaking riddance. Last for Kahili is Oricorio, who takes 50% from Stealth Rocks on the switch. Unfortunately, Oracorio outspeeds and gets off a Feather Dance, so one crunch isn't enough to kill it. Then on the next turn, Oracorio uses Teeter Dance, and we hit ourselves in confusion. I am so sick of these damn birds. 
But since I don't have any safe switches, I just stay in. And for whatever reason, Kahili uses Teeter Dance again, and then we snap out of confusion. So with a final crunch, we kill the Oricorio and finally put an end to this miserable, miserable battle. Stupid crazy bird lady. Okay, the final Elite Four member is Acerola, who could theoretically be a huge issue if her lead Pokemon Bayonet gets a bunch of critical hits. I lead Diver who gets off an Intimidate. And then I just start going for Dragon Dances. Yeah, I know Dragon Dancing is kinda easy mode, but it's really the only thing I could figure out for this fight, and even then it wasn't guaranteed. Fortunately, Bayonet doesn't get any critical hits as I set up two Dragon Dances. Then a Crunch takes it out. Second is Frostlass, and I actually needed the two Dragon Dances to outspeed this thing. But because I got them off, we outspeed and finish it off with a Crunch. Third is Delmize, so another Crunch takes it out. Fourth is Palisand, and even with two Dragon Dances, a Crunch won't one-shot this thing, since it's got a ton of defensive EV investments, so I need to actually use Black Hole Eclipse instead. But that's enough for the one-shot. Last is Drift Blim, and thankfully we have enough HP to safely knock it out with Crunch, despite losing a chunk of health from Aftermath. And with that, we've beaten the Elite Four. And somehow we did it deathless. But there's one final challenge left. Trainer Howe has come to challenge my right to the throne. So the final fight of the challenge begins. Howe leads his Alolan Raichu, and I lead Croc Climber. This Raichu is very fast and very strong. It knows Thunderbolt, Quick Attack, Psychic, and Focus Blast. This means that it is completely safe to switch from Croc Climber to Owlympics to dodge the Focus Blast. And then I can switch back to Croc Climber to dodge the Psychic. And I can repeat this until Raichu runs out of Focus Blast PP, which doesn't take that long since it only has 5 PP. After that, it's safe to start using Bulk Up, since Raichu can only damage Croc Climber with weak Quick Attacks. After two Bulk Ups, an Earthquake knocks out the Raichu. Then Crabominable comes out, and this Bucktooth Loser gets one shot by an Earthquake as well. Third is Primarina, who also goes down to an Earthquake. Fourth is Flareon, who also goes down to an Earthquake. And then fifth is Tauros, which actually will outspeed me. Our bulk ups will make its attacks do essentially nothing, but if it crits, it will kill Croc Climber. Given that Howe only has two Pokemon left, that wouldn't really be the end of the world, but I decide to go for a deathless finale. Digging eight graves is more than enough for one challenge. So I switch to Olympics to dodge a double edge. Tauros hits a pretty hard Iron Head, and then I retaliate with a Leaf Blade. On the next turn, Howe switches to Noivern, who easily tanks the Leaf Blade. I scout out an Air Slash with Protect, and then I switch to Old Faithful, Metalist. Noivern uses Super Fang for a good chunk of damage, but two Power Gems are enough to finish it off. So, Tauros comes back out as Howe's last Pokemon, and Metalist isn't the least bit intimidated. After a turn of Protecting for Recovery, I switch to Missy, who gets tickled by an Iron Head. Then I get back to full health by using Protect and getting some leftovers recovery. Then I use Recover to just let Tauros hurt itself with a double edge. And then, finally, after tanking one more double edge, an Ice Beam finishes off the Tauros, winning us the battle and the run. That challenge was quite the roller coaster of emotions. In some ways, I loved it. I really enjoyed how challenging it was, and I liked coming up with strategies for each of the unique totem Pokemon. The variety of Pokemon available in the game is excellent, and it was fun to use so many different Pokemon. This is definitely the largest number of Pokemon I've actively used in a single challenge, and there were even more that didn't get much screen time because I had to skip some major battles. Despite this, the game is insanely long and at times very tedious. Leveling up Pokemon and especially EV training are an absolute slog, and there are way, way, way too many cutscenes. I even knew that there were a lot of cutscenes going into the game, and I was still blown away by the sheer number of them. Ultimately, it makes the game have virtually zero replay value. I'm glad I played it once, and at times I had a lot of fun. This might even be one of my favorite hardcore Nuzlocke runs that I've done, but it's going to be a long time before I'm ready to pick this game up again. Anyways, as always, thanks so much for watching. This was a huge endeavor, and it's probably going to be my longest video by quite a bit, so I really appreciate all the support. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or, or don't. I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges, and you should also join the Flygon HG community Discord where you can discuss nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link to all of that is in the description. Stay tuned for more Nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.